It's legitimately way too hot out here to film, so let's go in the studio. I feel like the hat's pretty deserty. Maybe I should just wear it, or maybe I'll put it on halfway through. For now, I'm going Al Natural. I get asked a lot of questions about building a Joshua Tree. I've seen a lot of people try to build out there. They buy a piece of land only to find out maybe there's no utilities around it. Oh crap. They have to build a $50,000 well. Oh crap. Bring in $100,000 of electricity. Oh crap. When they could have bought another piece of land that was a lot cheaper and had utilities there and they have to turn out side of the loss. Ah, it's too hot today. It's complicated. So I figured I'd make this video showing you exactly the process. If you're looking to build out there, how it's gonna go. And for people that have some money saved up that are looking to invest it maybe in Airbnb, I do recommend building if you're gonna be in Joshua Tree. Because in the end, you're gonna have a house that you're able to control the design of next to the closest national park to Southern California with a bunch of equity built in, which is something you cannot do in a competitive real estate market. So in this video, I'll be going through the entire build process in the high desert for anybody looking to build out there, whether it be a second home or a primary home or an Airbnb, it doesn't matter. And a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in the video will translate to other areas as well. So I'll be going through the entire process from the beginning with land purchasing, custom home design, plan check with the county, finding a contractor, construction, Airbnb permitting, and all the gotchas with building out there. So yeah, there's a lot to cover here. I'm gonna be as succinct as I can while giving you as much information as I can, and yeah. So let's get into the first stage, which is purchasing land, okay? Now, you do wanna think a little bit about what kind of house you're gonna build, but you do need to wait until you have land to decide on that. Because the orientation of the land, the neighbors, where the sun goes up and sun sets, which is a big part of the desert, they're intertwined. That's gonna change how you're gonna build it. And this is a big deal out in Joshua Tree because there's a lot of showstoppers. There's a lot of land that looks good. You say, oh, this has a great view. I like it. There's no neighbors by. But the reason there's no neighbors by is maybe there's no utilities in the ground or there's no electricity. I just realized I could be not wearing pants and you guys would have no idea because it's only up to here. So yeah, purchasing land is very important out there because it's not cut and dry. Every single piece of land could be different. Your realtor can help you with that. The land you buy is kind of literally and figuratively the foundation that your foundation goes on. So start with financing. For financing the land in general in Joshua Tree, land needs to be bought in cash. The reason for this is, well, let me give you some background. In Joshua Tree, there's abundance of land. In fact, a couple years ago, before we saw this explosion in prices, land was pretty cheap. I bought a piece of land in the village in Joshua Tree for, I think it was 18,500 with water and electricity on it. It was a great deal. Today, a couple years later, that land would probably be worth about sixty-five dollars to $75,000, not more, and the prices keep going up. The reason is a lot of people have found this area and there's a lot of competition. So you can get land, land pops up, and you gotta have anywhere from fifty to seventy-five, even $100,000 ready to go in cash. Now as the prices are going up, land is sitting a little bit, and you can sometimes find places with owner financing, or you can sometimes find places that will take a land loan. And land loans are available. They are available for the higher price pieces of land. US Bank does them. You have to search around, but people will do land loans. In this case, usually what I've seen is 75% of the value, and you have to bring 25%. So if you have a $100,000 piece of land, you only need 25,000 to put into it. So although things have gone up, it's still possible to finance, but in general, if you have the cash, it's a lot better. So for the pieces of land, going to be financeable that are going to be sitting on the market they're in general going to be farther away from the center of the city which is okay the thing about joshua tree is a lot of people that get away there they want something remote and with the new airbnb update they're actually benefiting or premiering places or showcasing places that are a little bit more remote anyways i think airbnb wants to do less of a neighborhood disruption and wants more remote experiences so think of that and keep that in mind when you're looking at land a lot of these pieces of land that are far away five acres place like that that sits on the market, as long as you have utilities, which we're gonna get into, it could be a good deal for you. And so those are the kind of pieces of land that you can finance or something that's been on the market for a couple weeks or more, that's something that we can start to talk to them. And sometimes you can even try for owner financing, but it's rare. So let's go through the neighborhoods just so I can give you an idea of what the area looks like if you're not familiar with it. I grew up with family out there, so I spent a lot of time out there and things have changed a lot, but let's get into it. Okay, we're gonna do a quick rundown of the area around Joshua Tree in the National Park. And if you know the area, feel free to skip this section. And I hope the microphone's working. But let's do a quick one minute rundown of the Joshua Tree area and the National Park. Okay, so we have the park to the south. If you go south of it, that's the low desert where Palm Springs and Coachella and all those things are right there, Coachella. And there's an entrance to the park from the south and you can drive through. 
This is kind of the heart of the national park, and we have the north entrance where Joshua Tree is. Now we have Joshua Tree here. This whole land area uh, here is very highly sought after. It's really close to national park. It's really beautiful. It's very expensive. So those are a lot of the really, really nice houses, big houses. A lot of them were actually built a while ago too, um, when land was a lot cheaper. And then we have the village area here. Uh, this is where the civilization of Josh Tree is. You have the saloon and, and coffee shop and stuff like that. There's really not much infrastructure there, but I'm sure there will be in the future. Uh, if you go west, you have Yucca Valley. That's what we were talking about was incorporated back in, I think, 1991. And this is where like Home Depot, a lot of civilization is here. It's, it's kind of the city or the town. Okay, so Joshua Tree, if you want to be more rural, you can get kind of out here in this area. You can go north up here on the Mesa. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. If we go east, you have like Panorama Heights. Panorama Heights. There's a lot of cool areas here. Uh, they have a lot of like one acre lots here. Um, over here, there's a lot of well territory. It's harder to get water. Um, if you go north to Sunfair, I'm not a big fan of this area. It's just kind of low down, dry lake. You actually have the dry lake here. And it's just, there's not a lot of vegetation, cool cactus or, or Josh tree here. It's, it's a little uglier. I'm not a big fan. But if we go west, this whole area, right? If you just kind of expand your search to this whole area, uh, this is still Joshua Tree. There's a there's a line here somewhere that is uh, might be here, which is still east is Joshua Tree address, west is Yucca Valley. Um, but this 92252, uh, I think is the zip code. But yeah, you have uh, some good views here because it's up on a ridge and you have good views to the south. So this is a good area. You just want to make sure you have utilities. If you go west, these are also cool areas you have. Uh, it's a Yucca Valley address. Now, if we go west through here, we go through what's called Pipes Canyon. And this is a fantastic, beautiful drive if you've never done it. Beautiful views of the mountains. It's spectacular. You lose cell service in this area, but once you get to Pioneer Town and Rimrock, uh, it's a lot of uh, lack of water and digging wells. But uh, yeah, these are these are gorgeous areas, views of the mountain. Pioneer Town has Pappy and Harriet's that people like. and, and um, you know, a couple other cool areas, kind of like a, you know, a caliber, California version of a Western town. And we can drop back into Yucca Valley. See, Vaughn's, there's, there's a lot of civilization here. Uh, Friendly Hills area. So yeah, this area is great. This area is great. Talk about seclusion. The village is close in town to Joshua Tree. Uh, Panora Panorama Heights is great. We go all the way to 29 Palms. This area is growing as well. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening here. It's gorgeous. And as we get east of that, we get into some real California desolate uh, desert and it's it's gorgeous. There's not much happening out there, but if you just want to build a wild house in the middle of nowhere, and if you've never done this drive either, go for it. This is a cool, cool, uh, cool day to spend. So yeah, that's a quick rundown. That's as fast as I could do it. If you have any other questions, talk to a realtor or ask me and I'll help you out. So once you've identified a piece of land and you can set alerts on Redfin or Zillow, whatever you're using, and you can set your parameters, and I would suggest doing that, you'll get your notifications, check on land. And by the way, there's a weird thing that happens out there because there's a lot of land that goes up and there are pieces of land that will slip through the cracks. So don't get discouraged and look through things and talk to your realtor. And there's sometimes land that's pretty good that's been sitting on the market and you can't get a deal on it. That does happen. I bought two sites in the past six months in Joshua Tree that have sat on the market. They were great. And a lot of those have doubled in value. So it is out there. Because there's so many pieces of land, there's a lot of people looking, but there's action in the beginning and that tends to weigh off. Now you've got a piece of land and before you go under contract, you're gonna to wanna to make some phone calls to make sure that this is a land that you can build on and it's gonna work. Because there's things like flood zones, there's things like easements, there's other things you need to watch out for. You need to make sure that there's utilities, you need to make sure there's electricity, whatnot. So first we're gonna call land use services in San Bernardino County, say I'm looking to buy this. My intention is to build a single family residential home. I just wanna make sure that there's nothing on there like being in a flood zone or any easements that I need to worry about. Not everybody is helpful, so you sometimes you need to ask and be stern about it, but usually they're really nice and that's gonna let you know that this land is not in any crazy zone or whatnot. And also ask your realtor about that because they should be checking on this as well. But I like to take matters into my own hands. I just find it better and it helps you learn the process a little bit and understand what you're buying. The second thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure that water and power is available. Now essentially there's two different water companies out in the high desert. You have on the west, High Desert Water, and on the east, Joshua Basin Water District. Now High Desert Water is much easier to work with. They will answer the phone quickly you need an email, they will get it to you that day. You send in a form, within 24 hours it's taken care of. Joshua Basin Water District is way different. They're frustrating to work with. Now, I'm sure the people are nice, but 
That same thing that took 24 hours for High Desert Water is gonna take several weeks for Joshua Basin Water District. But you need to get the APN number, you need to call High Desert Water or Joshua Basin Water District and find out which one is servicing the water. And if there's a water main running through the parcel, they're gonna be able to install a meter. Now that meter is gonna range anywhere from like $7,000 for High Desert Water to seven to $16,000 roughly for Joshua Basin Water District. That's if there's a main in there. That's a minimum you're gonna have to pay to get a water meter installed unless one was installed already by the previous owner of the land. Now, if there's not a water main running across one side of the lot, you're gonna to have to bring water in from one of those companies or build a well. Bringing water in is very expensive. So much so that unless the water is within 50 feet to 100 feet of the lot, I don't even mess with it. It's so expensive. And building a well out there is very expensive as well. 30 to $50,000 I've heard for estimates. I've never done it. Because I'm not building the kind of houses that are gonna be worth three, four million dollars. If you are, then you want a remote lot with a bunch of boulders. And if you're doing that, that's great. I'm not doing that. I'm building three bedroom, two bath houses, and that's kind of my wheelhouse. I don't wanna to have to worry about water. Joshua Basin Water District, if you are with them, they do have a cool tool. It's gotten a lot better over the years where you can actually look at the map where the water mains are, and they can estimate for you how much it's gonna cost. It's actually really cool. Now, electricity zone with Southern California Edison. That's a little trickier. Sometimes you have power poles and sometimes it's buried. The problem with Edison is they won't give you quotes early on. All they will tell you when you call them and you should call them and give them the APN is they're gonna tell you whether or not they service that address. And if not, you're gonna to have to figure it out. Now, if you have neighbors close by, you can kind of estimate that, well, if there's one on the west and one on the east, or if there's one on the north and one on the south, yes, there's gonna be electricity there because they have electricity. It's just hard to tell how much that's gonna be up front. Now, it could be nothing or it could be $40,000. It's hard to say. And plus, if you have a big lot and you put the house back a little bit to be away from neighbors, which I like to do, that can add for cost too because of trenching and whatnot. It's, it's uh, something to think about. But the most important thing to do is give them a call and see what they have to say. And you just want to make sure if there are no neighbors, you're going to be able to bring power in. So yeah, big picture is you need to do your due diligence before you go into contract and especially before you close. That's something that's really important because out in Joshua Tree, it's wild, wild west out there. And yeah, you gotta do your due diligence because you don't wanna end up having to sell the land later for a loss because you didn't do that. Okay, next thing to talk about with due diligence on purchasing land is Joshua trees. My contractor used to tell me that when he was a kid, he'd literally take shotguns and shoot the branches off of them. Nobody really cared about it. In fact, a lot of the old houses there in the Yucca Valley area, they just cleared them out and then cut them down maybe because they were annoying. Well, nowadays they're endangered species and it's something that you have to worry about. In fact, San Bernardino County has a document, IB0016, which is I think information bulletin, 0016, which talks about building next to Joshua trees. And you want to read this. There's a few of these you want to read. But this is one you want to read that talks about how close you can build to them. In general, you cannot build closer than 40 feet to a Joshua tree. That's to start. You can build closer to that. I'll talk about it in a second. But you need to kind of figure out, okay, how much space do I have between these Joshua trees? When I look at land in person, I always bring a measuring tape with me. And then what you end up doing is you just put that on the site plan. It's no problem. They'll sign off on it. But let's say that it's pretty tight and you think you're going to get closer than 40 feet. Well, there's a little known trick, which is you can actually get closer than 40 feet. You can get within 15 to 20 feet. You have to get a licensed arborist to go out there and they're going to take a look at the land and you're going to show them the site plan and they're going to send you a letter. They're going to sign their name and you can actually build closer. Joshua trees are really cool and I like to use the trees to kind of integrate into the kind of house I'm designing as long as I'm not going to disturb them and the arborist will let you know about that. So this latest build that I'm doing right now, I actually was able to put the patio about 15 to 20 feet away from them without disrupting them and it ends up being really, really cool. This house will be done in a couple months, I cannot wait. But this is something you need to watch out for. So you do want Joshua trees on there. It is valuable, it's really cool, I love them. There's something special about it. It's the uniqueness that makes the high desert the high desert, but you don't want so many of them that it makes the land invaluable. There's a lot of people that buy a big piece of land, it's covered with them, and they go, I cannot fit anything except for a porta potty out here, so I gotta get rid of the land, and unfortunately, I gotta sell the set of lots I ever paid for, whatever. So once you've gone under contract, you got the land, cool, we're gonna close soon. You wanna get going on the perk test and the address assignment. The interesting thing about Joshua Tree, why are there so many short-term rentals, why housing prices have gone so high, it's because there's no infrastructure for big hotels and whatnot. Everything runs on septic. Joshua Tree is unincorporated. Now the neighboring Yucca Valley is incorporated, but that only happened in the 90s. When I was a little kid and my aunt lived out there, it was an unincorporated area just called Yucca Valley. So there's local sewer in Yucca Valley, but Joshua Tree is a lot smaller. You don't have that. So things run on septic. So you have to do what's called a perk test. 
and you give a company a few thousand dollars and they're gonna come out and they're gonna drill something and they're gonna da 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 and a couple weeks later they're gonna give you a report that says cool this thing perks we can get a septic here and they're gonna design a septic system for you and tell you what it has to be but that process takes a while in fact sometimes it can take a couple months because they have to drill well, that drill date can be a few weeks in the future. And then once they drill, they gotta do the report. This can take a while. And so you wanna get that done because when you're in plan check later on, that perk test needs to be sent to a separate entity that needs to be signed off on. And then you have to send that back to county for plan check. That's a big bottleneck for a lot of people. So I get the perk test started as soon as I go under contract. Now address assignment. So let's talk about EZOP real quick because that's where the address assignment is done. So EZOP is San Bernardino County's website, which is where you do all of your applications for permitting all your uploading of plans and whatnot, and that's how you get things done. Once you upload, once you apply for a permit of any kind, it's routed to the right people and it's taken care of online. So you're gonna go to wp.spcounty.gov forward slash EZOP, and you're gonna wanna go to portal sign in, you're gonna wanna make an account, sign in, and from there, you're gonna be able to look at all of your permits. And address assignment is in a certain area, building another area and whatnot, that's what you're gonna do. So for address assignment, you can go ahead and follow the prompts and get your grant deed, which you can get a copy of that once you close from the title company, and you're gonna be able to use that to get your address assignment going. Now this can take several weeks, I've seen it done anywhere from three to five weeks. So you wanna get that started ASAP because you cannot go into plan check until that's done. So let's get to the next phase, which is actually designing a home. Now I know this is a really complicated subject. We're not gonna go into deep, deep detail on it, but we're gonna talk about it in general just to get people an idea that are maybe worried about it, don't know where to start, how the process works. You're gonna need to do some of your own research, but at the end, it's really, really rewarding to have this done because you wanna have a custom home. You wanna mold it to the land. You want something that's really special and you can use existing plans that are out there and you can mold those with your draftsman, your architect, whatever. It's special to do and once you do it, it's a good skill to have and it's not as complicated as you thought because you're paying other people to know how to do this for you and you wanna find somebody who's in the local area and understands the codes and the process. So this can be daunting, but it's not hard. You can get it done, trust me. So just starting off, like I said, idea generation, you're gonna to need to first understand and make sure you know about what kind of homes are in Joshua Tree. And I like to just go on Airbnb and with the new update, you can click on the different categories and start scrolling through and seeing what's booked and what's not booked. Now, if you're doing a primary home, you probably have your own idea of what you want. But if you're doing a short-term rental or Airbnb out there, yeah, you're gonna to wanna to do something cool. So start to scroll through and see what's out there. And also you can use Instagram and Google search. What I do is I just have a Word document and I start to throw pictures on there, colors on there, shapes on there, even if it's a fence or some breeze blocks that I like, I put it all together and I try to come up with something. After about a week or so, I got something locked in, I know exactly what I want. I use Instagram, I use Airbnb, see what other people have, and I literally use Google search. I just image search a bunch of stuff and that's how I do it because you're gonna need to hand this off to the person who's actually doing the design. Now before we get into the people doing the design, let's talk about budgeting. Now budgeting obviously should be in the financing section, but when we talk about home Home design obviously that's one of the limiting factors is how much can we spend here that's what architects always say give me a budget and then I'll design you something so we need to know early on how much we're gonna spend now we have the land that we bought we have our debt to income ratio for doing financing we have how much we can borrow we need to know how much we can spend on this house and how much we want to spend and we need to know ahead of time that there's furnishing there's unexpected stuff that could be rising costs so it's important to know ahead of time how much we're gonna spend before we get into it now once you have your ideas you need to make a decision here because we have architects draftsmen and engineers. Now, a lot of people don't know, they say, what's the difference between an architect and a draftsman? Well, in general, an architect is somebody who actually designs your house. It's the person who comes up with the idea. It's the person who draws up plans, 3D renderings. That's kind of what they do. The draftsman takes the architect's idea and turns it into technical detailed drawings that's gonna be used by your contractor, for plan check, we're gonna actually submit. And then the engineer takes the draftsman's drawings and does calculations on them to make sure that they make sense and says, okay, this is how deep the footings need to go. This is this, this is the shear strength, this is that, this is that, this is this, this is that, this, that. But at the end, they give you a stamped piece of paper that has all kinds of literally hand done calculations because they have to show the work that make sure that we can legally build and structurally build what we're gonna build. But the draftsman's the most important thing because that's what the contract's gonna go off of. That's how we're gonna get our permits through plan check. We need the draftsman and we need the engineer to make it legal. But the architect, well, that's up to you. I personally don't use an architect on my build because I use a draftsman that's a little conceptual and can take my ideas and my sketches and kind of work with me on it. Now, architects are expensive, but if you don't wanna use an architect, and you have a draftsman that does have that conceptual knowledge and the skill set, I like to go with that, even if it's my first build. 
because I can take some existing plans and change them a little bit and take the draftsman and say, can you change this? And we'll go back and forth and we'll take a couple weeks on it sometimes. And at the end, I'll be super satisfied. I'll say, okay, this is really working. So what I suggest is just literally doing a search and making phone calls, see if you can set up a video call and talk to a draftsman and say, what's your process like? What are your costs like per square foot? And how do you work? Say, I have this document that I kind of know what I want. Can you take that and build some plans for me? or I have some existing plans that I found and I wanna modify them, can you do that? And see who works well for you. Maybe talk to five or 10 people before you pick one. And another question you wanna ask them about is do they work with an engineer? Because you don't wanna to have to take plans from the draftsman and send them to a separate engineer. It's a lot easier if they work together because they can go back and forth and when you get plan check review comments back later on, you can just send it out to the draftsman and then get it back from the draftsman. Don't have to worry about sending it out to the engineer separately. It's a lot easier. So yeah, I like my draftsman because I can give him ideas and we can work together. So yeah, you're gonna start with your mood board. You're gonna give it to an architect if you use one. That architect's gonna give you detailed drawings. They're gonna be 3D renderings, wherever they are. And they're gonna design the home for you. And then you're gonna take that, either your personal design, your ideas, if you're not using an architect or the architect's drawings, and you give them to the draftsman. The draftsman's gonna take that and turn them into detailed drawings. They're gonna do a site plan that's gonna show where the house is. They're gonna do something called Title 24, which is California's way of doing energy calculations and you need to get that done. Usually the draftsman will do this. If not, you can actually go to a separate house, search Title 24 services, and there's tons of places in California that'll do this for you. You're gonna give them the draftsman's plans and they're gonna charge you a couple hundred dollars and then you're gonna have your final plans, your Title 24, and your stamped engineered plans. And by the way, the engineer needs to be in California. I recommend having somebody local to the high desert or local to the Inland Empire, San Bernardino County at least. And you're gonna get ready to send that big packet into plan check and get that process going. And I'm gonna talk more about the site plan in a second because the site plan is gonna get more and more detailed as you go through plan check. Because once you get comments back, a lot of times there's certain things you have to add like drainage and whatnot. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So yes, plan check. So in my opinion, this is the most drawn out tough part because you send things in and then you get them back. You have comments, it's complicated. Sometimes it's 50 pages, but don't fret. Every single comment on there can be figured out. And if not, if there's any questions between you, draftsman, the engineer, you can actually just contact the person on plan check. On the front page there, they'll tell you who's doing your plan check. Easiest way to contact them is via email. They'll have a phone number too, but usually they can't be reached. So it's easier to just send them an email if you have any questions. But you're gonna take your stamp plans, you're gonna take your Title 24, you're gonna take your PERC test, and you're gonna take your septic plan, which based off the perk test, you take your site plan, you send that all in to plan check. And you're gonna do that through EZOP, you can do a single family residential application, EZOP, and you're gonna upload this stuff. Once you upload it, they're gonna invoice your fees, you pay that, and once you pay the fees, then that's when the process starts. And you can expect a few months depending on if you're gonna have one or two or three plan check reviews. The first two are free, and then if you have to do a third one, which is normal, you gotta pay an extra couple hundred bucks. So the next thing you have to do, separate from EZOP, is you need to take your PERC test, which has a septic plan on it. By the way, when you do the PERC test, they're gonna ask you for a site plan. When you get the PERC test back, they're gonna have the site plan with a proposed location for the septic tank and all that jazz. That's gonna be on there. So we'll just call that the PERC test. You're gonna take the PERC test and you're gonna to need to submit it to EHS. I believe it's Environmental Health Services. But when you submit for plan check, they're gonna tell you how to do this. There's an email address that you send it to. They give you a receipt and an invoice. You pay it, I believe it's $333, something like that. And the process starts and they're gonna do a review. That's separate from your building permits and all that stuff, that needs to happen. And that's gonna take a couple weeks. You're gonna to wanna to get that started ASAP. As soon as you get that PERC test back, as soon as you submit for plan check, you wanna get this submitted to EHS. That's gonna take a few weeks, they're gonna come back, and either have any changes you need, which you can go back with the company that did the PERC test and say, I need these done, or they're gonna say, you're all good, and they're gonna give you a stamp set. You need to take that and the receipt that's stamped, and you need to upload that to EZOP. Now all the stuff I'm talking about, once you submit plans, they're gonna give you a bunch of conditions you need to fill out. Depending on where your land is located, and depending on your plans, and depending on a few other things, there's gonna be a different number of conditions. It could be eight, it could be 15, it could be 20, and you just need to go through and take care of all of those. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and call Land Use Services and the person answers the phone is usually able to answer that. If not, they'll send you to someone. You can get on the phone and talk to them. They're pretty helpful. And they have some pretty sick hold music. If I can, I'll get the hold music on there. So let's go through most of the basic conditions that happen. There's the will serve and the fire flow. Will serve is a letter from the water district, either High Desert Water or Joshua Basin Water District. They each have their own forms and their own process but you need to get these from those companies and get them taken care of and then upload them to EZOP. So the 
will serve, just them saying, we will serve this address, which you'd already called and done your due diligence, but you actually need the actual letter. And then the fire flow test is something where they come and they check your fire flow pressure. They check the pressure of the water coming out of the main. These are a couple hundred bucks for both of them. High Desert Water has a form on their website. Joshua Basin Water District has the form on their website. You have to fill them out, you submit back to them, and then they'll take some time. High Desert Water is gonna take 24 hours to 48 hours to get that to you. Joshua Basin Water District, good luck. Go on a trip if you want. It's gonna be a while. The last one I did took about two months. So you wanna get that started ASAP. Another one, which is gonna be called Habitat. They're gonna say this land is in an area that's known to have Joshua trees. Now, sometimes on your site plan, if you have no Joshua trees on site, you can just say no Joshua trees on site in a box and that will be enough and they'll sign off on that one. If there are Joshua trees, just note them on the site plan and say that you're greater than 40 feet away. Say that on the site plan in a box and that will take care of it. Now, if you're building closer than 40 feet from Joshua trees, you need your arborist letter which you can contact an arborist in the area and they'll do it for you. That's gonna take some time, but once you upload that document, they'll be pretty quick to sign off on that. And then we have the general red tape, other conditions. So much so, I'm gonna actually just read them here and let's go through. Will serve fire flow, fire approval. So separately, you need to do a fire approval. This works with the separate fire authority that you're working with in the area. And this is a permit on EZOP under fire. You're gonna click that and that'll take a week or two. And then once that's approved, that'll automatically be routed and the condition on your plan check will be satisfied and taken care of. So that's a separate one you need to do. School fees. So you do need to pay school fees. It's $3.33 per square foot, which can get expensive. That means if you have a thousand square foot house, that's $3,333. If you have a 2000 square foot house, that's $6,666, right? So you need to take care of that. That's a condition on there. It's a check that you mail out. It tells you on the condition where to mail it and when to mail it. You don't need to mail that right away because it's usually a lot of money. If you want to hold on to the cash, you can mail it towards the end of the process when you're getting your permits. Once you send the check in, they open it. It's pretty quick to get back, but you need to pay your school fees. Permit acknowledgement form. That's going to come from your contractor or you just signing that you have your permits. You don't need to worry about that till towards the end, okay? Okay. CDWMP, that's a construction waste management plan. There's two parts. Your contractor will fill that out. We'll get into contractors in a little bit, but that is something that your contractor is gonna fill out about how they control the waste of the project. The first one is done at the beginning, and the second one is done at the end of the project. Drainage review fee, that's something that's invoiced at the very end. I think it's $178. Erosion control installation. So this is gonna be done by your contractor. They're gonna install erosion control. This could be straw bales. This is something that I usually note on the site plan myself once I get it back from the draftsman. I have a little trick to do that seems to go through plan check well, which is just notifying that you're gonna have erosion control on each side. But with your local contractor, talk to them and they're gonna tell you how they're gonna do it and sometimes the draftsman has done this before and they have their own way of getting it through plan check. But there's a notification on this. You can actually read this. This is another information bulletin from San Bernardino County. You're gonna to need to upload your grant deed, which you got when you closed on the land. Fire sprinklers, you can actually defer this. My contractor has a fire sprinkler guy that does the plan and you can get your permits without having this. You can say on your plans that this is going to be deferred and that is okay. That'll get you through. And if not, you can actually search fire sprinklers and there's some local people that will take care of this for you, but my contractor has people that takes care of it. it makes it a lot easier. So that's plan check. You're gonna send the stuff in. They're gonna give you your plans back. You're gonna send them out to your draftsman, your architect if you're using them to say, hey, they need this change. What do you think of this? And they'll send them out to the engineer or you can send them out to the engineer if you're working with them directly. And yeah, fix them, take care of stuff, send it back in. If you don't get it done by the second plan check, go ahead and send it in for the third plan check when you do those changes and they're gonna invoice you later. Don't worry about that. You just wanna get your permits. How do I get these permits? Sometimes they don't make sense at first. Make a phone call and ask them. Yeah, so let's get into financing. Financing is something you need to really be thinking about before you start this because you need to know how much borrowing power you have, how much cash you have, how you're gonna fund this build. I'm assuming you wouldn't have gone this far if you didn't know how you were gonna pay for it. Now, if you are gonna be financing this, you need to know that there's construction loans out there. And a lot of banks, local banks, will do construction loans and the terms are really good. My mind goes ahead of my mouth sometimes. Okay, there's different ways to do this, but banks will do construction loans to permanent loans where they're actually gonna approve you for a permanent either primary or secondary or sometimes investment loan, which has different terms. But you just need to know there's different rules for each bank. If it's gonna be a second home, which is the best way to do it in my opinion. They just need you to live in the house like 14 days a year, whatever it is, and then you can do whatever you want the rest. Everyone's different, just check on that. And when I work with partners, when they use their borrowing power and I handle this whole process, do the design and all that stuff, and they bring to the table their borrowing power, they use a construction to permanent loan. And using cash is okay, um, but I personally like to have cash in the bank 
Cash is king, cash is precious. I like to have cash reserves in case something goes wrong. If I have a house that I design and build and I could sell this thing for a million dollars, that's a lot of power. Let's say I don't have a million dollars in the bank, using the bank's leverage, they'll buy it for me. I can pay them back with interest and I'm making money off the short-term rental that's covering all of this and then some and paying me back. Without the bank, this wasn't possible. For me, I like to leverage that. Or I'm using partners that have cash that they wanna invest with me and I use their cash to do this process and at the end, maybe we refinance into a commercial loan. There's no money in the deal or maybe we just sell the house and each split the profit. Leverage is powerful. There's good debt and bad debt, my opinion. This is good debt, especially if you have a lot of equity built in or if things go south, I can at least have a brand new house that I can rent out and break even on until things get a little better. It's a good way to hedge. The light just turned off, but I'm gonna keep going. So construction loans, how do they work? So they work just like any other loan. The application process is the same. You're gonna to need to bring all of your financial stuff, all of your bank statements, your W-2s, whatever you have, and you're gonna apply. And they're gonna figure out what your situation is, just like if you had a primary or secondary or any other house you're gonna buy that's existing. Construction loan application process is the same thing. The only difference is you need to have your plans done, and a lot of times they want you to be in plan check already, ready to go. And what they're gonna do with that is they're going to do an appraisal on those plans and the land and everything. You're gonna get that back and then the borrowing power, how much they'll lend you is typically tied to one, your debt to income ratio, which a lot of times is capped at 43%, talk about in a second, or the appraisal, whichever is less. So if you were gonna build a house that was worth a million dollars, okay, and they're gonna loan you 80% of the appraised value, the most they're gonna loan you, if it appraises at a million dollars, is 800,000, because it's 80% of the million dollars. Now, let's say that your debt to income ratio, so what's debt to income ratio? Well, it's how much debt, monthly payments you have, compared to how much income you have. The higher your monthly payments are, the less they're gonna loan you, because it's gonna be harder for you to pay back the loan. So they cap this at 43%. Let's say that every month you make $10,000 and that's gross. That's before taxes, not after taxes. That's one of the benefits. They don't factor that in. They use your gross amount. Let's say you have a W-2 job and you make 120,000 a year and you make $10,000 a month. Your total loan payments, including any car loans you have, anything that's on your credit report, what they're gonna use, any other mortgages, it can't be more than 43% of that per month. So that would be $4,300 and that includes the loan. So if you have $1,000 in payments from other stuff, let's say you have a $1,000 mortgage somewhere else, some small house somewhere, and now it's 3,300 left, that's how much they'll loan you. And a lot of times what you can do is you can just make some trade-offs if it's close. If appraisal is a limiting factor and it comes in low, you can just do some trade-offs and maybe say, okay, we're not gonna have the pool or we're gonna change this material or whatnot. So hard money is an option. Hard money is somebody just has a bunch of money, they loan it to you at a big interest rate, let's say 13%, and you go as fast as you can to build this house and then at the end, you sell it or you refinance it into a regular loan. If you couldn't get a construction loan, you pay back the hard money lender with interest. Personally, I would say I don't wanna use hard money if I only have one chip. If I have all my money saved up and I buy the land and I get the house built, I need to use hard money. That's tough because I can end up going bankrupt. If things go wrong here, I'm gonna be in a tough situation because if I get a construction loan in the beginning, all those terms are set and everything's approved for in the beginning, no matter what happens in the market. If I do a hard money loan, I have to pay that money back right up front or I'm stuck with high interest debt that's gonna be really, really expensive. If the market goes against me in that time, I can only refinance for less or I can only sell it for less, then I'm gonna be stuck with that difference in cash. I like to get all the loan stuff done in the beginning with a construction loan if I can. Or I've done this enough times where I have enough money where if I lose out one time, at least I did these other five or so that worked out where I've done this enough and it's not gonna kill me. Partnerships are another way. If you don't have the debt to income ratio but you have the cash, in a lot of ways it's a good way to do it because you can also do it with a friend. It can be fun. That's an option for people too. What I've done is a lot of people I know have cash or they have some money saved up or they have borrowing power that they're not using because they don't wanna buy a house in this crazy market so they wanna build. They come to me and I work in a partnership where I do the whole process, I design, I handle everything, and then they bring their money and we work together that way. And at the end, we refinance the house or we sell the house. Typically, my partners, I let them make the choice. That works for me because I know how to do this stuff and that's how I've worked with a lot of people. When you design this house, you wanna think appraisal. So you wanna look at comps and see what the appraiser is probably gonna think. Even though your house is really cool and you know that if you put this on the market to sell, it has all these cool features, it has the outdoor shower, it has the clawfoot bathtubs, the appraiser might not see it like that. The appraiser might just walk in, you know, with a 
some dip in his mouth and say, hey, uh, this house is worth this much. So keep that in mind when you're designing the house that the appraisal does matter. So I'm gonna talk contractors real quick. There's not too much to say about this, but you need to kind of do your due diligence finding the contractor. And how do you do that? Well, in Jocktree and any other competitive market right now, they're hard to find. And the contractors themselves are having trouble finding reliable people. It's a tough situation. I'm lucky enough to have a great contractor. He's one of the most desirable people out there. He's affordable, he's honest. We have a great relationship. I've been working with him for several years and I'm lucky to have that. And like a mechanic, a good contractor is worth their weight in gold. And don't get frustrated if you're having trouble finding somebody. Just keep going, bug them, bug them, bug them. So there's a lot of Facebook groups for building in Joshua Tree. And there's so many different posts on there say, hey, I'm looking for a contractor. I don't have any leads. And there's all kinds of comments. And you can start there. And you can just start to research these people, make phone calls, and see what they have to say. A lot of people will get back to you, and then you talk to them, and then they flake. Don't worry about it. You just need to find the right people. A good resource for this, obviously, is different forms and groups. But your realtor will be able to, a lot of times, find somebody. Because the realtor is a lot of times local and has relationships. You contacting a contractor cold might not work. Relationships are so important in this kind of thing. So due diligence. Just like you purchase land, you do due diligence to make sure that it's a good piece of land that's gonna work out long term, you need to do your due diligence on a contractor. Contractors are notoriously bad, and if you find a good one, that's great, because hopefully you'll be able to have a future relationship with them. If there's more money to be made, you guys can work together, form a partnership, and it's great. So how do you do due diligence? Well, I like to make sure that I can find other pieces of work that they've done, get some examples, not just a picture of a kitchen, but like what house have you built? Are you local? You wanna find somebody local because there's a lot of rules and regulations out there. You need to be with somebody who knows the county that they can make a phone call to Edison or they can make a phone call to the water district and say, hey, I need this. The contractor's gonna help you with this stuff if you have a good one. And this is the benefit of a good realtor. They'll stick their neck out to find somebody for you and maybe urge them, hey, work with this person. And once the contractor actually gives you a contract to sign, you'll need to talk to them about it. Don't make payments for work that's gonna be done in the future. Say that there's milestones that when this is done, you get paid. When this is done, you get paid. This and this and this. And really go through it. Ask all the questions you can. Don't come from it at a place of frustration. Just come from it and say, hey, I honestly want to talk through this because this is a big deal for me. So once this happens, we get to the actual construction process. And if you built a house before, you know that this is probably the easiest part. Once you break ground, you lay back and you let it happen. Excuse me, is this Sarcasm 101? No, it's Lamaze class from Men Named Arthur. And the first time the grader comes out there and clears the land, and they start wetting it and the foundation goes in. It's really, really exciting and it's so worth it. And if you live close by, you can go out there and see it every now and then. It's super fun. And the construction process is really on the contractor. You wanna go out there and check it. The county will have inspections or if you're in Yucca Valley, the city, they'll have inspectors come out and they're gonna check on things. That can hold things up a little bit. But the big thing about the construction process is certain things like tile and other things that you're gonna have to pick out, right? Maybe in the contract, they included the cost of labor to put it in, but you need to pick out the tile. These are things you need to stay ahead of because there's gonna be long lead times on things and you're gonna to need to say, oh, it's almost time for appliances next month, so we need to start thinking about that. And you find the perfect appliance, maybe it's the only appliance that's gonna fit for your design and we're not gonna have that for 10 weeks. Well, that's gonna be a big limiter. Maybe not a refrigerator, but other things like cabinets and this and that. So you need to start thinking about this early on. Talk to your contractor and say, when are we gonna need this? What's the timeline for this? And you can stay ahead of it. What happens with the construction loan? You let them know that this is done and you request a draw amount and that draw will be based on what's actually been done and completed. They'll send an inspector out to look at it and then they'll send the check into your account and then you can pay the contractor. That's the flow. And then once it's done, you get final inspection, you get your occupancy permits, and you're all good to go. But important thing is 80-20, the Pareto principle. The Pareto principle, I don't know why I can't say that. It's true here, which is 80% of the work is gonna get done and the last 20% is gonna take the longest amount of time. That's my application to the Pareto principle when it comes to building a house, is that the last part, it's gonna draw out. There's gonna be all these little details. Maybe there's a propane conversion kit for your stove that you need and that's hard to get because it's hooked up for natural gas or whatever. These kind of things take some time. It's the details that really take a lot of time when you're building a house. And then after final inspection, there's gonna be a lot of other things that probably came up that you're gonna to wanna to add to the house. Maybe fencing that you didn't think about before, landscaping that wants to be changed, 
little things that you wanna add, shelves, closets, this and that, that stuff can add up, and then after final inspection, that's when that can be done. So yeah, once you're done, you got your occupancy permit, you've gotten a mailbox, you've installed that, you put numbers on it with your address on it, you've called the post office and said, hey, let's start getting mail here, you've gotten your trash service set up, all this is good, and you're ready to go, it's exciting. Now, I had a house that initially was a short-term rental, it was doing really well, and the market was so hot, we ended up selling it. I go back and forth on whether we should have done that, and we've parlayed that into all kinds of other stuff, which is great, but that's a big question. It's a philosophical question that you're gonna have to ask, and that really means how much do I believe in the high desert and how much do I want to stay here and a lot of times what you do is you furnish the house and you put it up as a short-term rental and you see how well it does maybe it's not booking as well as you thought so let's go ahead and sell maybe we take the money and we run and we put it into something else and a lot of people complain about capital gains taxes I almost moved to Florida and I have to be California capital gains tax but the truth is that if you're operating California this California house you're gonna to have to pay capital gains tax which is gonna be like 40% roughly but I also think if I was to operate as a short-term rental, well, I'm gonna get taxed maybe 25 to 30% on that anyways. And you can always do a 1031 exchange into some more property, which will defer those taxes, and you can then maybe take those profits, put it into a couple different houses, that kind of a thing. Personally, I'm inclined to keep the house or sell the house and just take the profit as is and do something else with it. Invest in another business or something else. Diversify it, do something in another part of the country. That's kind of the way I look at it. But in general, I like to keep it. And furnishing. So when you're furnishing the house, and I do suggest you furnish the house, even if you're gonna sell, because in the $20,000 you're gonna spend furnishing the house, I think you're gonna get that back. I would suggest furnishing the house, even if you're gonna sell. It just helps pop it. But if you're gonna furnish to sell or furnish as a short-term rental, those are two different situations and the furnishing is gonna be different. Furnishing for short-term rental, maybe the couch is going to be a pull-out couch because that's what people are going to want. So these are things to think about. The furnishings are going to depend on what you're doing. You do want to make it look nice. Don't get super cheap furnishings. I look at some kitchens out there and I don't even know what these people were thinking when they designed the house. You do want to go somewhat premium on things out there because it's kind of an arms race and you want to stick out. One thing I will say, if you are keeping it and you are using it as an Airbnb, you're going to need to go through San Bernardino County's permitting for short-term rentals. Now this is also on EZOP. There's a lot of information at str.spcounty.gov and you can go through the whole process there. They take them as they get them and short-term rentals are gonna be changing in Joshua Tree. I have a lot to say about that. There's a lot of grandfathering in of short-term rentals in places that get regulations that change. So some would say that if you do have one grandfathered in, that it's worth a lot and it'd be good to keep it. Other people wanna get their money and run because of the psychology of real estate, which is real. If people stop getting bookings, then they sell and there's a panic and then the market drops and then there's some good deals there. So yeah, there's a lot to be said about that. I'm already dreading editing this video because there was a lot of mumbo jumbo here. I hope it made sense and yeah. Feel free to reach out to me. If you do need consulting for a build you're trying to do in Joshua Tree, I do consulting on this. I'm happy to consult or I'm happy to partner up with the right people. Good luck out there and thanks for watching.